Um, so what I want to do is just uh, go slowly and talk, talk about what, uh, things in three parts. I want to talk about how I came to write and then rewrite the book. I want to say something about the book itself and what it has to say about the Arab world. And I want to say something about what I think its contribution is and where it might suggest topics for, um, for new topics for research. Um, and I will pause after each of these uh, three sections, the, uh, the genesis of the book, the book itself, and the co its contribution in case we can do questions as we go along. Or please put up your hand if you uh, feel that I'm not explaining it properly. So its genesis has a very precise origin for me. That is in the spring of 2009 when I read something in the newspaper about President Bouteflika of Algeria planning to change the constitution um, from two terms to more terms, which signaled at that particular time in the Arab world that you were going to be there for life. Almost all Arab constitutions had a two-term limit, like the American, the American Constitution, yes. And, um, and so once that constitutional bar was changed, you knew something was up. And the second thing I remember about this uh, piece of news was that uh, it mentioned, I can't remember, it was in Le Monde or somewhere other, one of the French papers that covers Algeria rather better than the English-speaking newspapers, English-language newspapers, that it was at the urging of friends. They said to him, Bouteflika, you are a wonderful man. Why don't you stay on? And this is the, this is the two themes. First, it is the decision to um, change the constitution and be like everybody else in the Arab world, all the Republican presidents in that time, except the president of Lebanon, who has a, who has a one six-year term, and that has never only rarely been violated, and the president of um, Iraq, who was the successor to uh, Saddam Hussein, and was of no particular importance in this story. So I'm talking about seven out of the nine Arab republics, which at one stage had presidents for life, and the mechanisms for why this took place. So that's how, that's how it started. But then um, there was a problem. I had never written about personalized power before. When I was growing up in, a, in history, um, we were against the great man view of history. We disapproved of books called Mubarak's Egypt or Hitler's Germany or something, as though the personality of a single man was the key to an understanding of the political process and the political structure and the political struggles and so on. But I did remember hearing a course of lectures at Oxford long ago by an English historian you probably have never heard of called A.J.P. Taylor, who did have an interest in the daily calendars of presidents and how much time they spent at his desk. And I remember him saying that Hitler spent something like 14 or 16 hours at his desk, whereas Mussolini spent only two or three hours at his desk. Of course, it's subsequently been revealed that he spent a certain amount of time with his lady friends on his desk. But in terms of his work <laughs> ethics, um, the, you know, there's something to be, I, I realize there's something to be learned about the exercise of, of presidential power simply from their calendars and how much time they spend on the job and how much they delegate to their, the people around them. So I had some license, I felt, to think about great men. And um, I had also prepared myself by writing, it happened that I had written a book, a biography of Lord Cromer, Sir Evelyn Baring, because um, I'm when I joined the Harvard History Department in 1993, it was the thing, it was very much in vogue to write biographies, so I thought I'd better try my hand at biography. So I chose the biography of somebody who had served in India because I wanted to go to India, and also in Egypt. And so I had some, uh, some idea of uh, writing biography. But in this particular case, it, um, in, in the Cromer's case, I found myself being drawn into 
the kind of biography where you're interested in um, his wife and his all kinds of things, personal life. But in this particular case, um, although I, I became interested, I was more interested in uh, the exercise of presidential power and, and how, that, how one could think about that. But the problem, of course, is with um, Arab heads of state, and no doubt many others, that um, their life is extraordinarily opaque. It's secret. You, it's, there are no memoirs. Um, th uh, there are no personal papers. That continues until the present day. It's not clear how one would write a proper biography of President Nasser of Egypt, for example. Um, his, his wife left a most interesting memoir, which came out after I... Uh, started work on these kinds of things um, in which you see him in a completely different light as a kind of conspirator he was constantly saying um, my dear you will hear sounds in the night but don't wake up and uh, he was leaving arms, caches and so on and, uh, and you get a very good idea of Nasser the conspirator which was part of his, part of his uh, personality but it's rare you get such an inside view so, um, in my case, I, ha I, it, I depended very much on it as a team effort in which, um, and this is one of the points, I mean, it is my book, but it relied enormously on help from a variety of friends. I taught it a bit, and I got my students to bring photographs of the wives of the presidents shopping, anything I could get to have some sense of what was going on. And I relied tremendously on um, people like the Egyptian Shibli Talhami, who had actually met Mubarak. I mean, I was constantly wanting to know what was it like. Um, and in the case of Shibli, he was telling me about, this is towards the end of the Mubarak's rule how he was bored out of his mind, he'd done it all before, he, was, he just sat at his desk waiting to be entertained and then he went off and sat in an armchair and he didn't read the newspapers anymore. So these kinds of anecdotes about presidents were something that I also went looking for. And, uh, uh, and it's something now you can, uh, if you have some sort of network of Middle East people, I was constantly bombarding them with emails about did somebody do this and in the case of Bouteflika, it remains, nobody knows whether he's married and nobody knows whether he has children. I mean, that's rather surprising, but enormously important for the future of Algeria. I think we now realize he doesn't have children and therefore um, uh, when he dies or when he steps down, he will, the party and the uh, pouvoir, the generals in Algeria will choose who the successors, successor are. But of course, whether you have sons, has um, uh, how old those sons are is important. For somebody like Mubarak, he was in power for um, 30 years. So you know, the Mubarak who came to power in the early 1980s after Sadat's assassination was a completely different Mubarak from the Mubarak 30 years later. So you have to also, it's not just the life of such a person, but um, divide it up into early Mubarak, middle Mubarak, and late Mubarak. And um, there are significant changes as you, as, as you go along. And then, of course, interestingly in his case, pressure from his wife, Suzanne, that their son, Gamal, should succeed, and then he gets brought back to Egypt, and he's prepared, and so on. So that's, um, it has to be a team effort. So I wrote this book, and it was ready on uh, the 31st of uh, December, 1910. And that was in uh, in late December 1910 poor Mr. Bouazizi the Tunisian set himself on fire and that is the beginning of the Arab Spring and then Tahrir is 2011 so I wrote a book about a defunct group of men who were busily being overthrown um, around the Arab world and I didn't know what to do at that stage but given the fact that um, one thing you do know about revolutionary processes is that they're messy and day to day and I thought if I tried to catch up with post-revolutionary Egypt or post-revolutionary Syria, I would be lost. And so I thought in the end, I better just acknowledge the fact that um, the book was out of date before it was published, um, or it was describing 
it had to be the rise and fall and not just Arab presidents for life, which was the original title, um, and that it has to stand as a historical document in its own right. It was what somebody thought at a particular stage about a group of people, most of whom have gone, but not all. But, I mean, some people, Bashar al-Assad is still there, and, uh, and uh, the president of Sudan is still there. So not all the presidents went, but the, the presidents, the, the, three pres the three most interesting presidents to me in North Africa, Mubarak and uh, Gaddafi and uh, Ben Ali went. Okay, so that's, um, uh, so I leave it, and I think it also has something to say about the, uh, it has something to say about Arabism and the clubbiness of Arab leaders and so on, which uh, if you look at the uh, cover of my book, which I didn't choose myself, but there is Gaddafi and Bashar al-Assad having a joke and you can learn a lot from the body languages of the club of these men and also learn, I mean, they meet, the, the, the Arab heads of state used to meet regularly. I don't know how often they meet. And they would bring with them an entourage of uh, security officials and policemen, and they would meet too. So this clubbiness and this Arabism and the way in which they learn from each other and the, what to do and what not to do um, is an also an important part of the story and an ongoing part of the story. Because one of the things one can say about the Arab Spring is that it, it is an Arab moment where um, there is a kind of Arabism which unites everybody across the Arab world from Morocco in the uh, west to uh, Kuwait in the east. There is a sense that what's going on in neighboring countries matters. There's a sense that lessons can be learned or not learned. I mean, one of the lessons about Bashar al-Assad obviously led that if you allow the Spring to go too far, you're done for. So you shoot the demonstrators at some stage when it seems to be getting out of hand. That's, you know, that's the lesson you learn as well as, uh, you learn what not to do as well as what to, what to do. All right, so that's the, that's the first bit, how I came to write it, how it was immediately out of date, and some defense of what it might still have to, why it still has some reason for you to read it about a particular moment in, um, in uh, Arab history. Now, um, the next bit is, um, what, is the, what is my argument about why this happened? And early on, I was put on to an enormously influential book by a gentleman of, of an Ind I think he's an Indian Muslim called Muhammad Ayyub. I think he's an, uh, an Indian Muslim rather than a Pakistani Muslim, who read it, who in 1949 talked something about the nature of the sovereign sovereignty that was developing in the non-European world after the Second World War, associated with, on the one hand, colonial independence, and the other with the United Nations and a world order which was based on the notion that the world consisted of sovereign states. And in the case of um, Ayub's argument, this protection of sovereignty was the first aim of the first uh, presidents or rulers of non-European countries after they became independent. They wanted to, uh, and they were in a situation in which um, you weren't quite sure that the United States or the British wouldn't return the old, uh, the old colonial powers in that case, of course, as they did in 1956. They went back to Egypt, the British and the French, and tried to over, uh, overturn Nasser. So the emergence of a strong man, of somebody who was determined to defend the sovereignty and the borders, and led on to an emphasis on Egyptianness in the case of Egypt and so on, of, of Arabness, that you wanted people who spoke Arabic, you want people who were somehow sons of the soil, you distrusted foreigners, foreign influence, foreign language and so on. So you have a strong assertion of national sovereignty defended in most cases by um, somebody who becomes more and more authoritarian over time. Um, and this is not particular to the, uh, this is not particular to the, uh, the Middle East. I mean, the same kind of thing was happening in Asia and so on, that um, strong men were, arose in order to, or appeared, and were encouraged by their people to defend the sovereignty by having an army that could defend the borders um, 
insisting that everybody spoke the same language and not foreign languages and so on and so on, which often led to the expulsion of people who were identified as foreign, foreign minorities, minorities, not the kind of people who uh, you want to have in your country. Then the next stage is that these people become increasingly monarchical in their practices. And if you look at American State Department um, documents about President Sadat, the successor of Nasser, who started as a humble man, but he starts living in palaces, and sooner or later he, lives in, he has two or three palaces. There is a kind of monarchical style that comes in from people who um, know they're going to be around for a long time. And in some cases, it becomes a bit absurd. People like, um, people like uh, Sadat um, invent his own uniforms and so on and calls attention to himself and behaves in a somewhat theatrical way, rather like Mussolini used to behave and so on. But it is an individual ruler calling attention to himself, um, acting out a particular role in front of his people at a particular time in human history. And then I noticed, and this is the story of Ben Ali's hair, which I and my students were very interested in. Ben Ali, the dictator of, um, of, of Tunisia, who came to power after the, uh, by deposing President Bourguiba, Tunisia's first president at the end of the 1990s, had an extraordinary bouffon hair. We privately concluded that he bought his hair from Berlusconi's hairdresser, and you know, his hair was flown in. And, and of course you can say this is absurd, but what is the point of that? The point is that he had to look young, that there was something psychological here that was interesting about that. That if you looked old, then people, you thought, or they're saying, well, what comes next? What comes next? So you had, to, you had this requisite to appear youthful for as long as you could to discourage people from wondering about who comes next. You wanted to give the notion to people that you would be there forever. Um, uh, although um, later on when, when it becomes important to various groups of people in order to, uh, uh, in order to imagine um, the system continuing in place, then people who are best called cronies and others say to the leader, well, um, we think it would be a good idea if your son succeeded you. That's the next bit of that. And I think anybody who knows about networks and business and so on, the cost of when one um, powerful regime goes and transferring your loyalties to a new and unknown person and building up trust is very expensive and you may lose out in that place. I mean, they used to be a, a notion which we don't use so much, the new and the old guard. The old guard is associ are the cronies of the old president, the new guard are the cronies of the new president, but the, se the idea is that you get as close to the president as possible and then to his family because you want a predictable succession. You don't want to have to renegotiate your political alliances in a situation in which you may lose out. But there were problems of this um, desire for, by the cronies and for the, um, the president and the presidential family and sometimes the presidential wife to maintain themselves in power um, uh, in a way that I think one could, it becomes a sort of morality tale because the efforts they made to perpetuate their regimes were in the end a large part of the reasons for why they were overthrown. You could tell going to Egypt in the, uh, before 2010, we, I and my Egyptian friends simply talk, stopped talking politics. As far as a young Egyptian was concerned, there would be Mubarak's forever. So you either put up with the Mubarak's forever or you left. I mean, there was a tremendous brain drain too, people who just couldn't stand that particular stultifying, no, stultifying notion that that will go on. And then the notion of a republic, uh, the notion of a sort of monarchical kind of person in a republic is also upset certain people, particularly in the army. I mean, the whole point of, a, of as we know, 
of republics is that they don't have a king, they have a president. And presidents who behave like kings were regarded by some people as shady and wrong, and you know, there was some, something basically wrong with the whole idea. And then um, you have the problem with on-the-job training. If you train your son, um, how do you train him? Does he sit at the desk next to you? Um, how do you do that? And there were certain ways in which um, I think Hafez al-Assad was quite interesting. He tested Bashar al-Assad to see whether he had the um, right qualifications. Because, you know, not everybody can rule a country like Syria. And not and uh, uh, copying your father isn't necessarily a recipe for success. So that the son has to be has to be trained, but in the Syrian case, you couldn't say to the Syrian people or the Syrian army, I am training my son to succeed you, me, because um, Syrian Republicans will say, well, that's not supposed to happen. But so there's a sort of trickery going on. You train him and you do kinds of, kinds of things and you make strategic allies with the head of the army, uh, Mustafa Tlaas, and so on. But there's a kind of going on there. And in the end, I think, um, as I say, I think it is a morality tale that um, the Arab Spring is very much to be seen in terms of a revolt against this particular way of ruling and the assumption in many Arab states that whatever was going on was worse, that the cronies were making more money, that the ruling family was going to be there forever, that they were putting on airs um, and so on. And it became disagreeable and embarrassing, I think, to be a young person in these countries where um, you were not, you know, this was not supposed to be going on in, uh, in human history. Presidents were, weren't supposed to be um, becoming monarchs and so on. And somewhere in the middle of all this, there is a famous um, uh, idea, Arabic word, which was coined by Saadadeen Ibrahim, the Egyptian dissident, who was in Damascus in 2000 for the death of Hafez al-Assad, the, the funeral of Hafez al-Assad, who tell, who's asked, he's a reporter for Egyptian radio, what is going on? And he says, we have reached the era of the Gumlukia. Gumhuria is a republic, Malikia is a, you know, and this is, the Gumlukia is monarchical presidents. And what happens when he goes back to Egypt? first thing that happens is the Mubarak's put him in jail. You know, what he's actually saying with Gumlukia is, watch out Egyptians. Uh, they are planning to, Mubarak is planning to succeed. His son has come back and he's, a, he's, he's planning a monarchical presidential succession. There's something interesting there also which we could talk about of course. Um, it also means the kings are becoming more like presidents the kings are having security states. So they learn from each other. So in terms of security, in terms of intelligence, in terms of style, um, there's not much difference between so-called monarchies and so-called uh, republics. Although there must be some difference because, as everybody points out, the kings are doing rather better in the Arab Spring. Morocco and uh, Jordan and so on haven't had as, mu as much trouble with their people, although They've had to look sharp and make some concessions and try and pretend they're going to turn into constitutional monarchs and so on. But that's, that's another story. Okay, so that's the next bit. That's what the argument is about um, why I think it's interesting and why I think this particular came, this thing came about. Um, and it was helped at a particular moment in history, and that is the neoliberal moment when... Um, the Arab states, the Arab governments were encouraged to sell off uh, their state properties, to privatize, to shrink government. And in fact, the monopolies, gas and so on, were bought by cronies for no money at all. So that um, the cronyism becomes much more important and much more obvious and much more dangerous in terms of, uh, of uh, monopolists. I mean, you can try in my book to work out how many cronies do you need in, ah, where is Bassam? Yes, I'm just asking about this. 
Egypt has a room for about, had room for about 25 cronies. I mean, this gentleman called Ahmed Ez had, um, had steel and somebody has electricity and somebody has this and that and so on and so on. Whereas Syria seems to get by with a smaller number because the economy is smaller. But anyway, there is, that, that is going on too. The privatization, which is demanded by the World Bank and the IMF, becomes the basis for a period of crony capitalism where there's just a massive stale, just as there was in Moscow to the uh, oligarchs in uh, roughly the same period in the early 1990s where the one man gets the oil and one man gets gas and one man gets hydroelectricity and one man gets something or other and so on. So that, it, that is also um, not unfamiliar. All right, now just the third part will be where do I think this fits and what kind of contribution um, does this make? Well, I suppose like anybody else who writes a book which is a bit different, you have to be humble about it. It's the first stab at something or other and, uh, and it's, I hope, an encouragement to lots of other people to come and write better books about different aspects of it. So um, that's probably anybody, any... Uh, writer can say that about what one is doing. It's a, it's a pioneering effort, but very imperfect in all kinds of ways, partly because it was written when it was, partly because it's so difficult to find out information about mm. uh, what is going on, although information will come out in time. There will be a proper biography of NASA at some stage, and there will be a, a better biography of Sadat, and so on. Secondly, it's about an Arab moment and the Arab world and what unites different bits of the Arab world and it attempts to show the operation of what I call something the Arab demonstration effect the demonstration effect the way in which different you know, there's a huge amount of Arabism around, there's a huge amount of meetings the police meet every year, the, these people meet and these meet, people meet a very important component of the Arab People think of the Arabism simply in terms of Arab nationalism and Arab unity, but it actually exists uh, much more powerfully than it probably did in Nasser period when uh, the notion of uniting with Egypt was pretty much abandoned as soon as it was attempted by Syria and, and Iraq. Nobody wanted to unite with Egypt because they recognized that um, you would be subject to a form of Egyptian imperialism. So unity, unity state to state, but Arabism learning from each other, uh, helping each other, having endless Arab meetings about this, and Arab doctors, Arab everybody, um, was very much part of um, the Arab world, and I try and demonstrate, as I say, the pictures of the clubbiness. Third, I think it has something to say about a particular form of the exercise of power, which I think I learned as much from, well, just thinking about various things. One is, um, if, you t if you listen to Bashar al-Assad, he really seems to think that everybody loves him. He really thinks, seems to think that the only people who are against him are a few foreign hired malcontents. Now, why, that sh why should that be? I mean, I think, he, I th I think that um, that's what he believes. But then if you think more, there are always cheering crowds. There is always him on television. So there is, you get the development of something that, um, well, it's a form of narcissism, but I see it as the Arab state in which the, the leaders after a while only see what they want to see or what their people around them arrange for them to see. And I think this is a very interesting phenomenon and not, of course, beneficial for what my mother would call the moral fibers of the ruler, but nevertheless, the idea that your people love you and, and uh, you're irreplaceable and so on, one can begin to see psychologically how that happens. And then that, of course, is based, with, that is, I think, in the case of Gaddafi, um, it's allied to a certain kind of narcissism in which, like Narcissus, he wants to look in the mirror and see a beautiful representation of himself. And I got some clue about this when there was a moment in, um, when he came out of hiding at some stage um, in the summer of uh, 
2011 um, to show that he was still around. You know, there were rumors that he'd been killed by American bombs or something rather. And it's raining and he appears under an umbrella briefly on television and then you see, and this is most extraordinary, he gets a mirror out of his pocket and he looks at himself to make sure that his hair is okay or whatever he was worried about. And I think there is, it, it's very, um, the narcissism of rulers and their desire to see what they want to and what in Russian history is called the Potemkin effect where villages are suddenly produced when the czar or somebody is going around and then taken away. This whole arrangement of the life around the ruler I think is fascinating and it would be interesting if in the room you have something to say about that, how that, how that works. Um, it's a bit, de I mean, the, you get into pop psychology very quickly, so you have to be careful about this, but I think there is, there is uh, something there that, um, to, to, to be explored. And I got another, if you um, learnt more about um, Gaddafi's rule, and of course that was a bit odd and a bit strange and um, for all kinds of reasons, but he had a very bad temper. And it was clear that one of the incentives to s allow him to see what he wanted to do was save his son and his sons, knowing that if father got in a bad temper and was angry, like Kim Il-sung, I mean the little Sung, or whatever he's called, um, the one, you know, he might threaten to attack America. I mean, Lyria, after all, um, a, a serious attempt was made by Reagan to kill Gaddafi, as we know. You know father gets angry and suddenly American planes are overhead. So you, want, you don't want father to get angry. So how do you prevent him? You just persuade him that all is well, his people love him. You stage manage a kind of environment for him in which that particular aspect of his personality cannot be, um, cannot be dangerous to the family interest. Um, so that's then finally... Um, let me say something about how this might do uh, feed into various forms of future research. Three points to make about that, I think. One is the discovery that actually the power of these presidential power for life was severely limited, not simply because they were sta things were stage managed and they're, obviously the people around them didn't tell them how bad things were. That was, that was part of it. <coughs> But also, highly personalized power goes down um, particular networks of kinship and so on. So even in an oil state like Libya, where you had two, three, four million people and untold wealth, there were still poor people in Libya. The, the, way, the distribution was so highly personalized that unless you were on the person, unless you were part of that distributive process, that you belong to a tribe or invented a tribe or something or other which was some out there, you could, you could be ignored by the state. And I think that, you know, I can easily show that in Libya, but it must be true of other countries, whether other uh, places that were subject to monarchical dictatorships of this kind, where, um, where power is so personalized, the distributive channels to win over the people um, go along lines of patronage and kinship and friendship and networks and so on, but aren't universalized and therefore lots of people are left out. So that's one thing for future research. The second I think is, which people are beginning to talk about, is the revolutionary moment itself and what happens when you're challenged. And um, there's an article by um, a political science colleague of mine called Eva Bellin in Journal of Political something or other, about whether the police, whether the whether the, uh, when the revolution happens, whether the police shoot or not. And in Egypt and Tunisia, the army and the police don't shoot, but in Syria they do, and trying to use that as a key variable in deciding um, the regime response to uh, reaction of that kind. And here I have a particular in, because at Harvard we have quite a number of American uh, soldiers who are Arabists who've worked closely with the uh, uh, with the Egyptian army. And we happen to know that when the 
the Tahrir uprising began, both President Obama and Hillary Clinton actually rang Tantawi, rang up the head of the Egyptian army and said, don't shoot. So we know. You know and he would have been a very stupid man to shoot because um, Egypt is so highly dependent on America for, um, for uh, arms and for military support. So you can catch those moments too, and there's quite a lot, no doubt, to say about that. And then the last point, which I think is germane before an American audience and my students and so on, is this extremely difficult form of government called republicanism. You know, I mean, being British, I know, you know the theory of kingship, and um, that sort of works in parts of the Arab world, that the king is God's emissary on earth and so on. We know that. But if the people are sovereign, what does that mean? How do you actualize the sovereignty of the people? Who represents the people? And so once you get, once you stop having monarchical president, presence, and the people are present all over the place as they were after the Arab revolutions, beating on the door of the Tunisian Constitutional Assembly saying, we want to come in, we want to share with you this constitutional moment. We want to write the constitution ourselves. And of course that is a recipe for confusion, but I don't know how you do that. And it's interesting to go back to the American constitution. By what right did 25 white gentlemen draw up a document that says, we the people of the United States? Well, we can say, the people in the republic, in the liberal republic, of course, you can, it, it, some people have the authority to define who are the people. We, the people are like us, um, white gentlemen of a certain uh, education and so on, and the people are not black, and the people are not women, and the people are not this, although the story of America, of course, is the expansion of the electorate until the people become somehow everybody at the end. But this business of republic and starting from scratch and fitting the people in seems to me m extraordinary. And uh, you can well see why Napoleon Bonaparte, if you go back to the French model, French, the Bastille, the people all over the place, enthusiasm, excitement, nobody knows what's happening next. And then Napoleon Bonaparte appears in the, with his famous whip of grape shot in uh, 1794 and clears the people from the streets of Paris. The people are annoying and getting in the way of everything. And the people are made to disappear from the public stage. Of course, they may be somewhere else, but that's also, you know, it's interesting to think about how once you have a revolutionary moment and a moment of enthusiasm and a new constitution, how do you fit the people into that? It's in their name. The Republican dictators, for, like um, Ben Ali said, we speak in the name of the people and you have a referendum every now and again and the people say we love you or we want you to do whatever you want to do or something like that. But actually starting again with the people present in a republic is a much more complicated thing and it's absolutely fascinating, I find. I try and get my students interested in it. And you know, Here is a revolutionary moment, I say to them. Think about it. And uh, Members of the history department, and they don't, it's, they're not as excited as they ought to be. So um, I hope you will be excited anyway. And thank you for listening so patiently. Thank you.